Tower of Flies. In 1189, during the tumultuous period of the Third Crusade, Conrad of Montferrat led his naval forces into the waters near the coastal city of Acre, aiming to reinforce the siege against the city. Upon his arrival, Conrad encountered a formidable defense, the Tower of Flies. This tower, looming ominously over the harbor like a stone sentinel, was more than just an architectural marvel. It anchored a massive chain that stretched across the harbor, creating an insurmountable barrier for any naval force daring to breach it. Conrad, determined to land his forces on the island where the tower stood, launched multiple attempts to bypass this daunting obstacle. However, his efforts were repeatedly thwarted by nature's wrath. Fierce winds, treacherous waves, and unforgiving rocks, ultimately compelling him to concede defeat. The origin of the tower and its macabre name remain shrouded in mystery and myth. The tower was already an ancient structure when the Crusaders arrived during the First Crusade, likely built by the Phoenicians between the 6th and 4th centuries BC. Those First Crusaders believed it was the site of sacrifices offered to the god Beelzebub, known as the Lord of the Flies, as said sacrifices would often attract clouds of literal flies. Another theory suggests a more mundane origin, speculating that the tower served as a dumping ground for refuse. Regardless of its name's origin, the Tower of Flies instilled dread in the hearts of sailors and soldiers alike. The harbor chain, known as a boom, represented a naval commander's worst nightmare. Ships attempting to attack Akar found themselves trapped by the chain, becoming easy targets for arrows, artillery, and other projectiles launched from the tower's high vantage point. Ironically, the Tower of Flies, which now thwarted the Crusaders, was a creation of their own making. When European forces initially captured Acre during the First Crusade, they rebuilt the tower and installed the chain as a defensive measure. A century later, after Saladin's forces retook the city, these very defenses turned against their original builders, contributing to the tower's ominous reputation. Hand Grenade The city of Jerusalem is filled with relics from wars of the past, and some are more obvious than others. Buried in the sand of the city lie large numbers of ceramic jars, which archaeologists have been excavating for decades. While most of these jars were used for mundane storage, a select few tell a darker tale. Crafted with unusually thick ceramic and bearing traces of explosive chemicals, these jars appear to have been early incarnations of a weapon still in use today, hand grenades. The presence of sulfur, mercury, and magnesium on their shards suggest an early understanding of explosive compounds. Packed with chemicals, these medieval grenades served as a lethal surprise for enemies. Once hurled, they would produce not only a deafening noise and dense smoke, but also lethal shrapnel from their ceramic casing. Although the exact scale and effectiveness of these grenades remain uncertain, contemporary records describe the terrifying impact of jars of fire and sound thrown from city walls onto besieging armies. Scientists speculate that the smoke's varied color and density depended on the specific mixture of materials in each grenade. Beyond the walls of Jerusalem, another fearsome weapon of the era was Greek fire. This incendiary weapon, closely guarded by the Byzantine Empire, was known for its near impossibility to extinguish. Capable of burning on water, wood, flesh, or any other material, Greek fire played a crucial role in Byzantine military strategy. The use of Greek fire was pivotal in several battles, notably during the Arab sieges of Constantinople. Byzantine forces utilized fire ships equipped with pressurized hoses to spray the substance, wreaking havoc on enemy vessels. Arabic fleets faced devastating losses, with many ships burned down to the waterline. Despite its historical significance, the exact composition of Greek fire remains a mystery as the recipe was a closely guarded state secret and has since been lost to time. Wutstiel Arrows scream, horses cry, the sounds of men fighting and dying echo across the city of Jerusalem as the forces of the legendary Saladin try to bring the defenders of the holy city to heal. A Christian knight stands on the wall, dueling a Saracen soldier. The Saracen gathers his strength, and with a mighty heave, 
crashes his sword into the blade of the knight. With a deafening shriek, the Christian's sword rips in half. The foot steel of the Saracen scimitar has destroyed the inferior metal of his European opponent. Foot steel, a material shrouded in mystery, first made its mark in history when Alexander the Great encountered it in India during his conquest in the 4th century BC. Presented as a tribute, this steel captivated the West with its exceptional strength, yet the technique for its creation remained a closely guarded secret in India until the 19th century. The steel the Crusaders faced was indeed this legendary Wurtz steel. Its quality was so superior to their own blades that there are numerous accounts of European weapons being cleaved in two by Arabic blades. The reason for this disparity in weaponry is simple. Middle Eastern kingdoms traded with India during the medieval period. The West did not. The secret of Wurtz steel's remarkable properties lies in its unique manufacturing process. Created using a crucible method, materials rich in iron and carbon, like certain woods, were combined inside a clay container and heated to about 1400 degrees Celsius. This process, sustained for several days and followed by a cooling period, yielded ingots known as Wurtz cakes. These were then skillfully transformed into blades by master smiths. The intricate process resulted in a metal with a distinctive pattern, combining high-quality steel with exceptional craftsmanship. Lost for centuries, the recipe for Wurtz steel was only rediscovered in the late 20th century. Scientists found that its strength and durability came from unique microstructures within the steel, such as carbon nanotubes and cementite nanowires. However, the exact historical method of its discovery remains a mystery. Even with modern technology, decades of trial and error were required for contemporary metallurgists to approximate the process of making Wurtz steel. The true origin of Wurtz is likely lost to history, and there's every possibility that the copy of Wurtz we produce today is still a shadow of the metal that struck fear in the hearts of European soldiers during the Crusades. The Mythical Army of Prester John Throughout much of the medieval period, the Middle East was a battleground of large-scale warfare. European forces, comprising multiple crusades led by various kings and spurred on by a succession of ambitious popes, were driven by a singular goal, to capture Jerusalem and its surrounding regions. As kingdoms rose and fell, armies marched, and countless men died far from home, the Christian crusaders clung to any hope for a decisive advantage. The most captivating of these hopes centered around the legendary King Prester John and his mighty army. Prester John was said to be a formidable Christian ruler whose kingdom lay at the edge of the known world. For decades, he was rumored to have been a bulwark against the pagan hordes besieging his lands, his army powerful enough to eventually join forces with the Crusaders and decisively defeat their adversaries. As the years rolled into centuries, tales of Prester John's conquests circulated among soldiers and clergy. In 1145, when Seldrick forces abruptly withdrew after capturing Edessa, rumors abounded that Prester John's army had crushed them in a significant battle. It was believed that once the Tigris River froze, Prester John's forces would complete their conquest. However, the harsh winter reportedly forced Prester John to retreat, and the Second Crusade, lacking this crucial support, ultimately failed. The Third Crusade, which began in earnest two decades later, saw the resurgence of Prester John's name. In 1165, key figures, including Pope Alexander III, Emperor Frederick I of the Holy Roman Empire, and Emperor Manuel I of the Byzantine Empire, all reportedly received letters from Prester John himself, pledging support. Despite this promise, Prester John's army never materialized to aid the Crusaders. Today, we know several things about Prester John. His letter was forged. His army, which broke the back of the Seljuk forces in 1145, actually belonged to a Mongol tribe. Moreover, many exploits credited to Prester John coincided with military actions in the East that were unrelated to the Crusades. In fact, Genghis Khan's conquest in the East inadvertently aided the Crusaders on several occasions with many of his victories mistakenly associated with the mysterious Christian king. Whether or not Prester John existed is still unknown. There are many candidates for the basis of his legend, but none are a perfect fit. However, when the crusading armies of Europe needed money, morale, or an unseen ally, Prester John's name appeared. The widespread belief in his existence proved to be as powerful a weapon as an army of thousands. Assassin's Loyalty 
Conrad of Montferrat's struggles did not end with his battle against the defenses of Acre. In 1192, Conrad, who had just been crowned king of the Crusader state of Jerusalem, was returning home from a visit to a friend. Suddenly, two men descended upon him. Knives flashing, they stabbed Conrad in his side and back. Though his guards killed one man and captured the other, the new king died from his wounds. Conrad had been felled by one of the Crusaders' most mysterious enemies in the Holy Land, the Assassins. Formed in 1090, when Hassani Sabah captured Alamut Castle, the Assassins were a society of Shia Muslims that believed in secrecy and subterfuge. Spreading quickly and capturing several fortresses, a branch of the Assassins began targeting rulers and important figures who they believed threatened their existence. For three centuries, they wreaked havoc on Muslims and Crusaders alike. Though the Mongols finally brought them down, the Assassins are believed to have killed three caliphs, Conrad of Montferrat, the Count of Tripoli Raymond II, and Lord Philip of Tyre, among hundreds of others. The exploits of the Assassins terrified the Crusaders, and tales of their fanatical loyalty spread like wildfire. Stories circulated of the Assassin's leader using drugs to convince his followers they had visited paradise. These tales evolved into elaborate myths, suggesting that initiates were drugged and taken to a garden of earthly delights to secure their absolute loyalty. Legend has it that the loyalty of the Assassins was a weapon that made them stronger than any army. The best example of this is the tale of Henry II of Champagne. When Henry threatened Grand Master Rashid ad-Din Sinan with his army, which outnumbered the assassins ten to one, Sinan scoffed at him. The loyalty of his men, Sinan claimed, made them unstoppable. Henry was shocked when one of the assassins proceeded to jump off the roof of a nearby tower at Sinan's request. Though the truth of this event is unknown, one thing is certain. The assassins struck fear in the hearts of those who opposed them. Are you ready to unlock the secrets of the past? Subscribe now to Dark Five's brand new Ancient Mysteries channel and embark on a journey to uncover the most enigmatic and awe-inspiring mysteries of ancient times. Leave a comment if there are any ancient mysteries you want us to explore in upcoming videos.